Okay. Today's book is The Life of Mahatma Gandhi by Lewis Fisher. It's a nonfiction biography. So, uh, j just a bit of quick background here, given my history uh, with Gandhi. Um, I, my first exposure to Gandhi was watching the 1982 movie in 10th grade social studies class. Teacher played the movie in its entirety. Um, it took several days. I, I think it's like a three hour movie. We watched the whole thing. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I'd, what's there to say? I was really impressed. I thought he was a great man. I saw the same movie again in 12th grade with the 12th grade social studies teacher showed it to us all three hours in its entirety, broken up over several days. Uh, looking at it back, looking back at it now, it seems like maybe that wasn't the best use of class time, but I did not complain about it at the time, you know, like, sure, show me the movie, anything to get away from the textbook. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, I think actually there's a case to be made for watching movies as educational tools. Uh, I remembered it, you know, like if, if, if I had read it out of textbook, I don't think I would have remembered it, but like the drama of that movie, like it was just, you know, seared in my mind. Gandhi in South Africa, Gandhi in India, Nehru and uh, Jinnah and the partition of India and Pakistan and Amritsar and all of that, I like remembered it. Um, and I've, I've seen the movie uh, in the years since, like rented it out on my own time. Uh, so, um, for far too long, I've relied on that movie as kind of my only, my only knowledge of Gandhi, uh, or my primary knowledge of Gandhi, aside from, you know, like, articles and stuff like that. But, really, I, I should have read a biography of Gandhi a long time ago. I don't know why I waited until this late in life to do it, uh, but, um was looking for reading material a few months ago at the bookstores here in Saigon. The selection in Saigon is limited, but they had this biography of Gandhi, and I thought, oh, right, perfect. I've been meaning to read a biography of Gandhi for ages now. So, picked up the book. Uh, I didn't realize this when I first picked it up, but this is actually the book that they base the movie off of. Uh, this, this, this biography was published way back in 1950. Uh, Sir Richard Attenborough, who's the guy who did the 1982 movie, uh, you can see his quote here right in the front cover, he was a big fan of this book, and they, they use this book as a basis for the movie. Um, which has positives and negatives. I mean, like, on the negative side, I'm not getting a diverse view of Gandhi. I'm still getting the same, the, you know, kind of the same view of Gandhi from, from people who are Gandhi's adherents. Uh, so it's not, it's not a critical view. Uh, on the positive side, though, I guess after seeing the movie so many times, it's nice to read the book that it's based on. It helps me kind of appreciate the movie a little bit more, understand it more. Um, so the the if if you remember the 1982 movie, those of you who have seen it, uh, the movie starts out with Gandhi's assassination, then it kind of goes into his funeral, uh, and then it kind of jumps back in time and goes over his life. Um, that they must have got it from this book because this book follows the exact same structure. It starts out with his assassination, a uh, detailed description of kind of his last day, everything leading up to his assassination, detailed description of the assassination and his aftermath and of the funeral, and then jumps back in time, goes over Gandhi's life. Um, also, if, if you've seen the movie, there are some of the, some of the lines of dialogue from the movie you will recognize in this book. Uh, of course, like, it should be vice versa. I mean, the, the book is the original. That's where the lines of dialogue came from. So, you, you know, that's kind of neat seeing where it came from. It's also interesting, though, n now that I've read the book, um, I can see just how much they kind of changed for the movie or just how much was fictionalized for the movie. Um, which isn't necessarily a criticism, although could be a criticism. Um, but for, for the moment, I'll just state it as kind of a, a neutral thing. Like I think, I mean, obviously, movies need to need to 
need to make the material into a narrative and so there are certain choices that they have to make. Um, you could you could debate some of this maybe, but uh, so um, I don't think it's practical to go through the whole movie and redline everything that was different from the book. It's a long book, it's a three hour movie, but it might be instructional just to look at a small section. Um, now you have to bear with me. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna put in clips of the movie in this book review. I'm. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna assume maybe you're familiar with the movie, uh, and just kind of uh, remind you of certain scenes. So there's that scene in South Africa when Gandhi is first getting into politics. South African government has passed that law that Indians have to register, uh, that they have to get fingerprinted and that only Christian marriages are now legally recognized, which means kind of, you know, Hindu and Muslim marriages, Indian marriages predominantly, are invalidated. Uh, and so Gandhi, they, they have this big meeting in the hall. Gandhi makes a speech. People are yelling things out from the crowd. I'll kill any British man who tries to, uh, you know, uh, go into my house. And the British, uh, um, policemen are sitting right there and Gandhi says, no, 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 it has to be peaceful. Peace, uh, he gives this kind of philosophy of nonviolence. Um, so a lot of that actually comes from the book. Uh, some of the quotes that were shouted out in the meeting come from the book, but uh, it wasn't actually in that big meeting in that theater hall. Uh, those were things there was no kind of give and take between Gandhi and the crowd in the theater hall and the actual meeting. These comments kind of came up in preliminary committee, committee meetings where they were kind of discussing the issue, not kind of shouted out in the crowd. Uh, there, there's no record of the British policeman being there, uh, which, you know, takes away from the drama of it a little bit. I think the movie added the physical presence of the British policeman in the actual meeting to kind of create that drama. And also, they're smudging the issues a little bit. Uh, so the the meeting in the meeting in the theater hall was held because of the registration and the fingerprinting issue. The the issue about the marriages becoming invalid uh, didn't happen until later on. Uh, so they're they're kind of bringing that issue in ahead of like the chronology. Um, all that's fair enough. It's then, those of you who remember the movie, have seen the movie, will perhaps remember this is then followed by a scene in which as part of the protest, they burn the registration cards. So Gandhi and his, uh, and his compatriots are out there, they've got the registration cards, they're doing a public burning of it. The British soldiers kind of say, oh no, that's government property, you can't burn that, and come up and try and stop them. And when then Gandhi keeps feeding it into the fire, they start beating him with the batons and there's this real dramatic scene of Gandhi being beaten by the policemen but still trying to feed the cards into the fire as they're kind of beating him. Uh, not physically resisting, you know, not, not doing anything violent, but still being uh, defiant until the last. Um, so that never happened. Um, it, like, as far as I can tell from this book, unless I got it from a different source, but uh, I doubt it. Um, what happened was Gandhi and the rest of the Indians who refused to register were, were arrested, um, but there was no dramatic scene of him protesting and getting beaten up by the policemen. There was an incident later in which the, uh, the Indian community did burn a bunch of the registration cards in protest. Gandhi wasn't there, he was already in jail at the time. And it doesn't, the book doesn't say anything about the policemen coming in and beating anybody. There was apparently no confrontation with the police. So that, that whole scene in the movie, that dramatic scene of Gandhi kind of getting beaten by the British policemen is uh, apparently completely fictitious. Um, and in fact, in this, in this book, in the whole of this book, there's really no scenes of Gandhi getting beaten up by the policemen. There's a couple scenes, passages in the book, where he gets beaten up by a mob. Um, once it's kind of white uh, South Africans who, who are, you know, upset with him, and it's the police who actually kind of save him from that. Uh, and the other time it's uh, his, the other Indians, his own people, who were upset because he was, uh, he, he 
they perceived him as betraying the cause because he had made a compromise with the British government. So, uh, but there's no, there's no, apparently history has not supplied us with a scene where Gandhi is kind of getting beaten with batons by British policemen. They wanted that scene in the movie, apparently, because, um, you know, I think especially the movie was 1982, so this was after the American Civil Rights Movement. The images from that were in everybody's consciousness. I think they wanted some sort of analogous scene to what we picture with the American Civil Rights Movement, with policemen beating Gandhi with batons and Gandhi just kind of passively non-resisting, I mean, resisting non-violently. Um, but but there, was, there was no historical scene, so they invented one. Which, yeah, I don't know. Is that, is that, is that fair enough? Uh, is that one of the licenses you take when you make a movie? Or is that being a little bit dishonest, maybe, with your portrayal of history? Um, so, you know, like those kind of things. Like, uh, definitely, st I, st I still like the movie, but it's, it's, it's always interesting to take a historical movie and then kind of read the actual history behind it. It's, it's maybe, maybe it's an intellectual exercise we do too seldom. We just kind of take the Hollywood version of it too often and don't just kind of go through it. Anyways, enough about the movie. Um, talk about the book. Um, so, the book. This was published in 1950. Uh, Gandhi was assassinated in 1948, so just kind of two years afterwards by Lewis Fisher. Now, I, I didn't know who Lewis Fisher is, was before, but everything's on Wikipedia these days. Uh, and he was an interesting guy. Uh, he published a number of kind of uh, books and was a journalist for many years. Uh, and he was involved with the left. He was kind of in, you know, like the, the left of the 20s and 30s and in the Spanish Civil War and stuff like that. Uh, and then he denounced communism, became an anti-Stalinist, eventually. Um, and, and then, uh, I think, contributed a number of articles, like, against Stalinism in the 40s and 50s. Uh, and he was a friend or an acquaintance of Gandhi. Uh, he knew Gandhi, and he writes himself into the book. There's a chapter somewhere in here, uh, My Week with Gandhi. So you, you read this book, and on one hand, you kind of think, ah, Fisher, you're, you're making too much of this. You know, you, you were a slight acquaintance with Gandhi, and you're just milking this for all this is worth, and you know, really kind of blowing up your, your contact with Gandhi to, to, to kind of make it more than it's worth and brag about it. Um, but on the other hand, like, even if he is kind of bragging, and I think maybe maybe he is a bit, uh, it does make the book more interesting. You know, it, it adds that extra personal touch, you know, it, it kind of coming at it from another angle. Uh, like, the, it's, it's, a, it's a break in the narrative, like, until then everything is described in the third person. Uh, with kind of brief references to, he'll throw in brief references to his conversations with Gandhi. Uh, and then he changes into the first person with that My Week with Gandhi. So it, it, you know, mixes things up. I'd say even if Fisher is kind of making too much of his acquaintance with Gandhi, it justifies itself in the book. It uh, makes the book more interesting. Uh, he also had conversations with uh, Nehru and Jinnah, um, which, are, which are in the book as well. Um, he does not like Jinnah. Uh, Jinnah comes off negatively in the book. Uh, and if you, again, if you recall the 1982 movie, Jenna kind of comes off kind of negatively in the, the movie. Uh, and I, I'm sure that's where the movie got it from. Um, interestingly enough, there, there are some things that are noticeable by its absence. There's, um, how do you pronounce his name? Sub Chose Rosa? I'm going to have to look this up. I don't remember. I always kind of mangle the name in my memory. Um, uh, sorry. Ah, uh, yeah. Subros Chandra Bose. I might be mispronouncing that right. Who was kind of um, the militant voice of Indian nationalism during the time. Uh, so Nehru and Jinnah figure in this book. Uh, Bose is... Uh, there are a couple sentences which allude to him. 
like in passing, but he's pretty much out of the narrative, which I, um, and in the movie, he was out of that movie. So again, that's probably where they got it from. Uh, and my, my understanding is for a few years there, he played a big role in Indian history. He was president of the Indian National Congress, which was the Gandhi's organization. Uh, and Gandhi had kind of brought him into the fold to try and kind of control him. And then when it turned out he couldn't be controlled, Gandhi had instrumented his kind of getting kicked out of the presidency of uh, Congress. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting that he's not in this book more. Um, I think, I mean, obviously it's a biography of Gandhi. It's not a complete history of India during this time. But um, it's, it's, it's an interesting omission, and the, again, it's reflected in the movie, I guess, and you can see that there. Um, so the, the writing style. Uh, it's a easy-to-read book. The, Louis Fisher, he was a journalist, spent, uh, you know, that was his profession, and he, he's a good journalist. Like, he skillfully tells the tale. Um, it's, it's an easy read, it's an enjoyable read. I, it's one of my favorite, I, I'm going to put this on my list of kind of favorite narrative histories. There is some editorializing going on in here, which kind of breaks up the narrative momentum a little bit. So he'll describe something, and then he'll talk about like how great Gandhi was to do this, uh, and how much you know this kind of showed that Gandhi was a great man. Um, and uh, you know nothing against the editorializing. Well, I, maybe some people would, but like, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 I didn't disagree with him. Uh, it did, it did break up the forward momentum of the narrative a bit. Uh, so if you know if you're looking for a good narrative history, that kind of breaks up the story a bit. But yeah, uh, on the whole, a very readable, well-written narrative book that's, that's just great for people who like to just kind of read history as hobbies, like I do, and want just kind of want to get involved in the story. It's, it's, it's good storytelling here. Um, Louis Fisher is uh, an accolade of Gandhi. He loves Gandhi. There's, there's maybe... Uh, so there's an admission that Gandhi's parenting could have been a little bit better. Uh, he, he, uh, he was a bit too strict with his sons and one of his sons just kind of ended up falling apart because of that and uh, becoming an alcoholic in his adult life. Um, and I think the, um, there's maybe some disagreements about, you know, Gandhi was against uh, mechanism, against machines. That, that's oversimplifying. He wasn't against all machines, but he was, he was, he was weary of weary of too much mechanization. And I think maybe Lewis Fisher is a little bit skeptical of that, kind of that comes through a little bit in the writing. Um, but on the whole, he is just firmly on board with Gandhi. Uh, he thinks Gandhi was one of the greatest men of the 20th century. He kind of praises everything Gandhi did. Um, so uh, Gandhi, of course, has his critics. So if you're looking for a critical book about Gandhi, this, this is not it. Maybe, maybe it would have been interesting to kind of balance his praise with some criticism to get a balanced view, although, I don't know, maybe, maybe Gandhi really just was that great. Um, the, I, it's funny, I was talking to a friend, I, I mentioned I was reading this book, and my friend said, oh yeah, it must be interesting, you hear so much negative stuff about Gandhi these days. And I thought, what? You you hear so much negative stuff about Gandhi. I mean, like, God, like Gandhi is widely regarded as one of the greatest men in history. I mean, that you know, I, I think that's a fairly objective statement, right? That's that's how most people view him. Um, but I think you know what's been happening. What might have been happening is that anybody, any hero who kind of spends too long on a pedestal, just kind of in this modern age, we have to kind of knock everybody off their pedestal. So you have all these contrarian uh, clickbait articles now that, you know, all the terrible things Gandhi did that you never knew about, which are kind of floating around in certain circles. Um, the, the right wing has never liked Gandhi. Uh, they don't think his pacifism was realistic. Uh, they think, uh, they, Churchill, Churchill, of course, this tends to be forgotten in America, but Churchill and Gandhi, Churchill hated Gandhi. Uh, refused refused to treat with him. 
Um, so people who kind of are more sympathetic to Churchill and the British Empire, of course, don't like Gandhi. That's, that's not really my tribe. Um, I mean, I'm not really disturbed by those criticisms because I'm, I'm kind of on the other side of the ideological spectrum. Um, the, the ones that kind of, I think, are more serious are the criticisms you hear occasionally made by socialists that Gandhi was only, per, only concerned with bourgeois interests, it, it wasn't concerned with the poor, uh, and that Gandhi was a racist against black people. Um, Fisher never directly addresses either of those in here. He never says, now some people think Gandhi was a racist or something like that. I think back in 1950, maybe this wasn't even on people's radar. Um, indirectly, though, you get a picture of Gandhi, which is completely anti-racist and completely, almost, a very kind of anti-capitalist view. Uh, almost like a proto-socialist, although Gandhi would not have identified himself with those words. Um, so, what, what a more critical view of Gandhi or biography of Gandhi would have had, I don't know. Uh, the, the quotes I hear about Gandhi kind of saying racist stuff, most of them apparently come from his early period in South Africa. And it is apparent in this biography that he evolved his positions on a number of issues. Uh, it, it, pacifism is something that evolved over time. Like initially, he, he recruited for the British Army for the Boer War and the First World War. The kind of absolute pacifism didn't come later in his life. Uh, untouchables, he, he evolved on that over his lifetime. At first, he was against intercaste marriages in India. Then later, towards the end of his life, he was only for intercaste marriages. Uh, and it was completely for integrating untouchables. So I think, I think it's reasonable maybe, I'm kind of reading into this my own opinion, but it, um, I think maybe any of the racist comments he made about black people in his early days in South Africa, I don't think that's representative of the later Gandhi. And in this book, he's, he's concerned about black people in America. Uh, it, it's Louis Fisher in his week with Gandhi says this was an issue Gandhi was concerned about. Uh, and Gandhi said to him, this is in the biography, and I think this is such a great quote. He says, a civilization is judged by how they treat their minorities. And I thought, oh, that's, that's so true. Um, and, you know, like, nowadays, uh, I think we've, we've got an Islam problem in America. And it's, there, it, it doesn't come out of nowhere, right? Like, there's a reason why people are afraid of Islamic is Islamic people like there's a history there now I, I mean I know there's a difference between the terrorists and the ordinary people but um, but it's easy to see where people would kind of get that kind of fear of Islam from the terrorist issues that are in the news but even even with that you have to protect the minorities and I think Gandhi's absolutely right a civilization is judged by how they treat their minorities you know how, how you treat the weakest people in a civilization. Um, yeah, so, uh, so the, the, the criticisms of Gandhi you often hear um, about him only being concerned with the capitalists or him being kind of a racist, uh, you, you don't get that impression at all from this book. You do get the, uh, yeah, the example of Gandhi, boy, I, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm captivated a bit too much by the description in this book by somebody who, who's completely, was, who wasn't critical of Gandhi, but it's, I, yeah, I was really just amazed by what a wonderful person Gandhi was. Um, I mean, like, you know, like you read history and so much of history, virtually all of history is just kind of selfish, evil people doing terrible things. And it's so rare you have a person like Gandhi uh, who had such like a wonderful philosophy and who just sacrificed everything and just um, spent his whole life just kind of working tirelessly. And the thing is like Gandhi, he wasn't concerned about like the end goal, like getting independence or whatever. He was concerned that everybody treated each other with respect. So like um, when he was campaigning against the British, he made this very clear with his followers, 
you know, you have to love the Englishmen. The Englishmen are also our brothers. Um, and he was meeting with the Viceroy, and people will say, you can't meet with the Viceroy, he's the enemy. And Gandhi said, you know, we can attack systems and rules. He said, we cannot and we must not attack men. Uh, we are imperfect ourselves, so we must not judge other people. Um, and I thought, wow, you know, like, um, that's, that's, that's right. Uh, and, you know, you, th you think of the political situation today and uh, how much of it is just, you know, the right and the left just kind of hate each other and they're always attacking each other and there's, there's none of this trying to kind of give each other respect or kind of give, like, assume that the other person has the best interests at heart. So you always just kind of assume that the other person uh, is evil. Um, and Gandhi would, Gandhi would assume, um, like for example, he was at a, at a meeting and he was saying something in a speech and somebody tried to shut him up. Uh, and Gandhi said, you, uh, don't be angry with her. She's doing what she thinks is right. Uh, it's, it's her love of India which is trying, causing her to try to shut me up. Um, like he was just always so generous to his opponents that way, which is, is something that's completely lacking in the political discourse today. And if I'm being honest, it's something that I am lacking in myself. My, my, own, my own discourse and dialogue has not given my political opponents the benefit of the doubt. It's, it's, it's not assumed that they'd, they've had goodwill. So this, it's, he, he gives such a wonderful example in this book and it's really, it's hard to live up to Gandhi's example. Um, you know, like, after reading, I'd, I'd be reading this book, and I'd be like, yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, I've got to treat everybody else with respect, even if they disagree with me politically. And then i put the book away, and then, like, two days later, I'm writing on Twitter, like, how dumb Donald Trump is, or, like, you know, kind of making these statements about, you know, how much Republicans are evil. Or, or, you know, forwarding those articles or stuff like that. So it's just, it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, but I think, I think that, that perhaps there's something to be said here. That the, you know, the way we're doing the political dialogue in America is just, nobody's going to win. Like this idea we have on the left that we're going to, you know, ridicule them so much that we'll win or, you know, something like that, you know, ridicule the other side so much that we'll win. It is not realistic. We're just kind of setting down a path which there's not going to be any winner with this political dialogue we're on. So I think, you know, I hate to say everybody ought to read this book because, like, uh, you, you can't. You have to be very careful when you say everybody ought to read this book. The average person reads a limited number of books in their life and you have to be very careful when you recommend a book to everybody. But, boy, I mean, I, I think it would be a better world if everybody read this book. Um, Gandhi was just a wonderful person. Unfortunately, you get to the end of the book and it's about the partition of India. And everyone in India just loses their minds at the partition. So the Muslims start killing Hindus, and then the Hindus start killing Muslims, and it's just cycle after cycle of revenge killing. And just, he goes into this in the book, and it's just brutal. I mean, like, you, 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 like they're killing children, they're kind of defenseless women and children, they're attacking and burning kind of whole uh, communities and slitting their throats. Uh, and you just, you read this and you just kind of lose your faith in humanity. And of course, it's not just India. You can find this, these examples from anywhere in history. Uh, and you think, geez, Gandhi spent his whole life trying to kind of make people respect and love each other. And then this happens at the end of his life. And it's difficult with this book to know whether to be optimistic or pessimistic about human nature uh, because Gandhi set such a wonderful example and then the history around him is just so terrible. I'm out of time on this video. I'm going to have to end it there. Uh, I recommend this book.